Hi everyone, welcome back to Box of Lights and welcome to our John Company second edition solo playthrough. John Company is produced by Whirly Geek Games, designed by Cole Whirly, developed by Drew Whirly and solo rules by myself, Ricky Royal, Richard Wilkins. Okay, let's dive straight into this thing. I'm going to teach you how to play as we play. So this is going to be a learning game, so it will take a little bit longer than normal. I'm going to give you... I think one video per turn. I think that's the best thing. So we're going to start with the 1710 scenario and try and dive into it as quickly as possible. Now you're going to need a few things. We're going to need the rule book. We're going to need the crown handbook. And this reference player aid as well. Okay, keep this handy. To play the solo game you're going to be playing completely with the regular rules. It's just like playing a multiplayer game with one player. But we've got the crown sitting alongside us. The crown is going to automate and kind of acts like two other players. So you're simulating kind of a three-player game. Now, indeed, the game plays three plus in multiplayer uh, without the crown. The crown is used in a one-player game and in a two-player game. So if you want to play two-player you'll also be using the crown as this third kind of element of chaos that sits alongside and interacts with the two players. All right, so in the, in the solo game, we're using the automated crown. The crown handbook, if you've seen my previous video, which was kind of an unboxing and introduction to the game, this is like a script, right? You don't need to read it. Just keep that off to the side and we're just going to refer to it. It's just like a reference book. The solo rules really... Playing with one or two, a very brief, it's kind of like a footnote at the end of the of the game. And there's a few little clarifications. But there's no extra real rules to remember. So to learn to play the game, you need to learn to play the regular game. And we can do this as we go along. Because this game is very much a step through phases. If you look, this is the main board. And running around this main board is this ribbon, if you like. And each one of these spots on this ribbon is a phase of the game. And it's very procedural. All the rules you need are in that phase. If you, okay? And as you push through the game, you're going to do this phase, this phase, this phase, in sequence. All right? Kind of counterclockwise as you go around the board. And each phase has its own little page or two in the book. Some of them are much shorter. Some of them are just a paragraph. Some of them are a little bit longer and might run over a page. OK, so that's how we're going to learn it. But let me give you a brief um, overview of what we're trying to achieve. We're a family, British family, back in England. We have a stake in the British East India Company, colloquially known as John Company. John Company is a trading company. They have a trading monopoly in India. This map shows you different regions of India. The regions of India divide into three presidencies. We've got Bombay, Madras and Bengal. Okay. What we need to do is go into India. I mean, we're bad players in this game. There's no, there's no two ways about it. We're going to be going into India. We're going to be trading with India. Potentially, we're going to be trying to control regions of India as well in order to kind of tax the local population, use the local population to our advantage. But mostly it's about trading and exploiting India in order to pull money back into our family, okay? into our family treasury. The route to victory, though, although we need money, we need money because we've got upkeep to pay. Our, our route to victory is that we're going to plant family members. These are our family members okay? into the company, into different office holders within the company, like director of trade, manager of shipping. Uh, military affairs, presidencies. We're going to put our family members into the company and then they're going to retire from the company. They're going to come back to England and they're going to pull the money that they've brought with them, that they've extracted from the company, and they're going to go and retire off as pensioners into these stately homes where they're earning victory points. All right. So this is about pushing our family members through the company, exploiting the company, retiring them, to create victory points. We have to have people in the company having seats in offices in the company in order to have them retire as pensioners and then head off 
to their stately homes, and that's our route to victory points. All right, so this is a game about earning victory points. In the multiplayer game, it's semi cooperative, and in the solo game, we're kind of semi cooperating with the crown. The crown is also a family with a stake in the company. In the multiplayer game, other families, other players have stakes in the company. They're all trying to um, squabble over these offices within the company in order that they can have retirees come back and earn them victory points. All right, so that's the the broad nature of the game. It's very much a negotiation game because it is that that that's where the cooperative nature of the game comes in. It's going to be a lot of table talk. Now, obviously, in the solo game, that's completely missing. Instead, we're going to be table talking, if you like, with the crown. We're going to be negotiating with the crown, the other age, uh, acting agent in the company. All right now, she has her own sort of autonomy. We'll be making her own decisions about how the company should be run, and that's what the crown handbook's about. And that's what we'll learn as we do the solo playthrough. All right, let's. That's that's the introduction, and I kind of gave you that already in the unboxing, but. If you're joining me now, <laughs> that's the overview. All right, so without going into too much detail right now, I was, let's, let's dive straight into it. Now, we do have a little bit of setup to complete. There's three flavours of scenario to the game. There's 1710, the early company, 1758, company under siege, and 1813, post-monopoly. I was tempted to go for 1758 because that will give you a little bit more depth. But I think what I'll do, because this is, likely to be one of the first videos you see. I'm going to do 1710 because that's the introductory scenario and then if you guys want me to I can then do 1758 and we'll do another video on 1758 but let's see how we go. This is going to be your introduction to the game. You're going to be playing 1710. Now you can play 1710 again as a longer version of the game okay as a kind of a fourth scenario but um, and that kind of runs through the every flavour of the game in, the, in kind of like a, well they call it a campaign, but it's still a single game really. All right, but we're going to start with 1710, it's the introductory game, it gives you the basic mechanisms of the game. The only thing that's missing is, this is my family board by the way, I'm going to play the Benyon family because I'm the pink player. Um, the additional scenarios offer this option of deregulation. What deregulation means is that the company effectively loses its trade monopoly and players can form their own private firms and we can start trading with our own uh, firm, okay, alongside the British East India Company. So you kind of then, you're, you're trying to keep the company running, but at the same time, you're also running your own little private firm off to the side who are trading in India and pulling money back for the family, kind of a little bit on the side, right? So that's what this second side to the board is about and it's this about this deregulation um, and used in these other three scenarios 1758 1813 and then 1710 long campaign right. there we go so we're going to start with the beginning if you want to see the, the other game so just let me know once this series is finished if it's something you're interested in seeing but hopefully this will give you enough that you'll be on your own and you can dive into that if you want to all right, so let's finish setup. So each one of these scenarios, we're going to do 1710, the intro scenario, has a setup card. It says, place a standing mark on a space above £10 expectations. Uh, we've got company debt set at zero. Place £3 in every company treasury. So we're going to do that. Now I've got the metal coins. So... The silver ones here are twos, the little copper ones are ones. So we're going to place three pounds in every treasury. On the board, there's one, two, three, four, five treasuries. You'll recognise them because they've got this little pile of coins printed on the board. All right, so we're going to put three pounds in every treasury. Then it says, place royal protection near the play area. One of the phases of the game, we're going to be passing new laws. Laws change up the rules of the game. Okay, So there's basic rule, rules and then laws kind of evolve. And there's a big stack of these rules. And every turn, you, you're potentially introducing a new law, which is changing some of the rules. Right? Kind of in a little legacy fashion as you play through the game. At the beginning of 1710, we've got this royal protection in play. So we're going to put this up in play. Basically, this is kind of like a get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, if the company would take any emergency loans, the chairman may discard this card to avoid those. Okay, so it's taking emergency loans is a bad thing. 
but we'll come to that when we get to it. So this is like a little save, a little save if you like, extra life. All right, so that's a past law. Um, starting regiments, place one regiment in the army of Bombay, the army of Madras and army of Bengal. These are regiments. We can recruit people to come and fight for our armies. Yes, this is a, a, an industry, this is a company, this is a business, but unusually what happened is they started to have their own armies. Okay, so one regiment, these are the regiment tokens, these are the army boxes. Again, we'll come to those in details, but we're just running you through the setup. Starting company ships, none. And then on the flip side, there's a map of India. And what it asks you to do is set up India in this fashion. And that's exactly what we've done. We've got these domes in every region. So you'll find there's eight regions of India. So there should be eight domes on the board. If you see a zero, it's just a flat dome on its own. Okay, that's a zero strength region. If you see a one here, you place one of these towers, one of these plastic towers underneath the dome. If you see a two, you'll place two towers, all right? So that's the strength or the inherent strength of the local region. The other thing you'll see here is these dark gray ovals. These are closed orders. So you place one of these closed order tokens. They're double-sided. One side says filled, one side says closed. You place them over these little oval shapes. These are called orders, all right? So these are closed. If they don't have a closed token, then they're open. So that's open and closed orders, right? These are places in India where we can do trade. And then you'll also see some have these flags. There's one with a star. That's called a capital of a little empire. And we've got a flag with a star. And there he is sitting in the top. It doesn't matter what colour you choose. We've gone for silver. And then the one without the star, we've got one here in Maratha. And they're a little bit smaller. And the one here in Punjab on this zero strength dome, all right? So we're setting everything up as per the map. Finally, there's a black arrow here, and this is the place where the elephant goes. We've got this little resin elephant. The resin elephant is kind of the attention of, well, where, where some activity might occur. Okay, so at the moment, Maratha's got his eye on Delhi. Um, and when events occur in India, these are things that are happening independently of us. When events are happening in India, that's potentially where they might occur, right? The focus of the elephant is kind of the focus of, you know, potential crises, uprising, or, or, or any other event that might happen. There aren't any governor overlays, but there are potential to add some of these tokens here on the board. Now, there's one thing missing from this, and that is there's these loot tokens. Okay, each region's got its own token, and you need to place, they're double-sided, one side's just got a little icon, the icon of the region, so the turtle here for Madras. One's got the turtle of Madras and a five pound. You need to place these, there's eight of them, one for each region, in the matching colour region. Okay. If you're not sure, if the colours are a little bit indistinct, find all the governor cards. And in the top left, it's actually got the icon. So there's eight governor cards. Okay. So the governor of Madras has the turtle. OK, that's Madras. It says Madras here on the board. OK, this is Mysore. Mysore has the peacocks. All right, so the peacock icon. Remember, with the numeric, the pounds up there on up, face up. All right, so that little bit's missing from the rule book. Don't miss it. All right, put those there. OK, these are going to go off to one side. We don't need them for the start of the game. And um, we've completed the setup of the board. So the rest of the setup, just all the little bits and pieces here, there and everywhere, follow through the steps in, in, the, in the book. It's all pretty clear. Okay. Right. Now we can go to the setup of the solo rules. And there are multiple difficulties, so I'm going to suggest we start with the easy. So there's an easy difficulty, normal difficulty, hard and expert. All right. So normal, there's nothing extra to do, but for easy, you're going to take these five promise uh, cards and you're going to keep those with you, with your, with your family. Right? In the regular game, toss those out. You're going to use these in a multiplayer game to, as kind of bartering chips to trade different things. 
with other players. In the solo game, ignore the text on them. They're just tokens, right? Five promises that we can cash in and we'll, we'll explain how those work. But we're going to use the easy game, take those five promising cards. There's one that matches a set of five for, for, your, for the colour of your family that you've chosen. All right. So here we are. We've got our family board. We've got our five promise tokens. We've got uh, promise cards, rather. We've got our 18 family members. We've got one of these glass beads. We'll come to that in a little bit. We've got the crown board. The crown board has 18 family members as well. Now, as it goes, you're going to use a second set. So for the crown, remember I said earlier, they kind of act like two extra families. Every family has 18 family members. Start with one set of 18. If the crown runs out, use a second set. So actually they end up with 36. So I've kept another set of 18 off to the side. Then we've got the promise cubes. You don't use these in your regular games. So they've got 12 promise cubes, six each, right? Six for the crown, six for you. This is the kind of the leverage that you have over the crown and the crown has over you. So at the moment we're kind of in a six cubes each. We're kind of in a neutral kind of state, right? We're equally happy with each other. If I have more cubes, then I have more leverage over the crown. I've done lots of favours for them, perhaps, and they kind of owe me some stuff. If I've got fewer cubes, then I've kind of probably pushed things a little bit too far. The crown is not so willing to negotiate with me. I've got to start doing some favours to the crown to get some of these cubes back, to get some of that leverage back so that I can start persuading her to behave how I want her to behave. Right? So that's what the promise cubes are all about, just for the solo game. Shuffle the AI deck, give that a good old shuffle. It's double-sided. This is the back side with the three presidencies on and these little arrows. This is the front side, all right? So this is the back, so keep it face down, shuffled up. So the next step and the final step, and this is kind of similar to a multiplayer game. Each scenario has a set of setup cards. Here they are, I've put them on uh, to one side. So the 1710, has a set of 12 setup cards, all right? They look like this on the back. There's some additional ones. They say extra up here. You only need those in, um, depending on the player count, just to even up the, the number of cards each, like in a five player game, for example, all right? So the solo game, you're gonna take the 12 1710 setup cards and give them a good old shuffle. Now there's two ways of doing this. We're going to get four and the crown's going to get eight, all right? You could just do this randomly, just four to yourself, eight to the crown, or, and the recommended way to do it, in fact, in your first, in your first game, just do it that way. Just deal yourself four, give the crown eight, and there's your setup. Now, a lot of people like the randomness of the variety, so it's offered up as a variant. Just do that randomly. The other way is a draft, and what you do is you... Draw three, look at them, and say, right, which one am I going to take? So you take one for yourself, and you give two to the crown. Okay, draw three, give one to yourself, and two to the crown. Um, I'm going to go president of Bengal. Right, draw three, two to the crown. I'm not going to go into detail about what I'm choosing. We're just going to look at these. Separately. But what it's doing is it's, it's allocating out, hmm, interesting, it's allocating out um, offices within the company to, uh, let's do this, let's do this. Right, they've got quite a lot of stuff. Okay, to the players for the start of the game. So every game you play, your setup's going to be slightly different. So in this draft method, you've got a little bit of agency over which ones you get, but still pretty random. We get all the stuff on this card. A good way of doing it is look at the pound signs first. We've got four, eight, nine pounds. Five, nine, that's our own family treasury. Okay, so each of these little offices has its own little treasury within the company. Okay, so the company has a balance as it goes for the start of the game. The company balance is five. Company money gets distributed among the company offices and then we can pull money back. We can exploit India by holding some of these offices. Like if we're a president and we're doing trade, we can a trade, we can cream off some of that trade into our family treasury. These are our family treasuries. Our family treasury is used to pay the upkeep 
on our retirees, on their mansions that they've gone back to earning victory points, but also our family treasury is used that we can we can spend this money to invest into the company, right? We can to increase our stake in the company by holding enterprises in the company. We'll come to that when we get to it. But we we use this family treasury in a number of different ways, right? But this is our personal budget as our personal player, as opposed to these company treasuries for these particular offices that the, only these office holders can spend. Okay. All right, so there's our personal treasury. We also get different um, offices. We get some different enterprises and so on. So let's go through these one by one. It says we get a ship. Okay, we get a ship and we place the ship in the West Indian Ocean. There's three presidencies in India. Each one has its own sea. So there's a West Sea, a South Sea, and an East Sea. Okay, so the West Indian Ocean is associated with the presidency of Bombay. And that's where it says I'm going to be placing a ship. So Bombay in the west. And in the west, there's a port. OK, so each of these three presidencies has a, has a home port. So here's the region of Bombay. And it has a home port here. Linked to the Western Sea. There's the presidency of Madras. Madras is here in the South Sea, a home port here. They have a kind of darker border, do you see? And then finally you have... Bengal, the Eastern Sea, its home port here. So there's only three home ports. There's only three orders. Remember, orders are open or closed. There's only three orders that are linked to the sea. They're the doorways into India via the oceans. All right. And so to get in and trade with India, we need ships that sail into these three ports by these three presidencies. There's a stack of ships. They're numbered. A to Z, okay? It doesn't matter what order they're in, you can shuffle this whole thing up and it won't make a jot of difference. It's just a way of uniquely identifying each ship. So just draw the top card from this deck. You don't have to order this deck, A to Z, or anything like that. Just take a card. Um, it's card just happens to be card number N. The ship is named the Neptune. I place this in my personal family area. I go off to the supply here. And I look for the Neptune, it happens to be right there. And it says to place that ship in the Western Indian Ocean. So I, my family owns this ship, right? And it will be trading on behalf of the company in India via the port of Bombay in the Western Seas. Make sense? Cool stuff. Oh, incidentally, we don't need these setup cards anymore. We can put those back in the box. We don't need this deregulation card because we're playing the 1710 uh, short scenario. So we'll put that away. We've got these extra cards here. Oh yeah, Governor General Trade. These these set these aside with the Governor cards. All right. All right, these can go back in the box. There's a couple of reference cards here. We'll keep those handy. All right. So this is our, our ship, This we've got a ship, we own this shipyard and the, sh the ship Neptune is fitted, in other words it's made seaworthy and out sailing up, up in the western Indian Ocean. Okay, cool. That's that card done. Right, next it says we are the commander of the army of the Bombay and we have a writer in the Bombay presidency. We take a family member, there's three armies. One for each of the three presidencies, Bombay, Madras, Bengal. There's a little oval with a commander icon in it. We're the commander of the army of Bombay. So we place one of our family members here. Okay, so we now, our family commands the army of Bombay, which at the moment consists of one regiment. Being commander of the army means that we get to decide if we want to invade or not. Invading means we get to kind of control that region. Right? It makes trade a little bit easier. It means we can tax the population. We can start building company ships there. The governor, so when we can, when we when a company controls a region, it creates a governor position. That governor can start exploiting that region for its family. It's also the only way to the govern getting a governor here is the only way to recruit more regiments. Right, so we've got that one done. Commander of the Army of Bombay, and it says a writer in the Bombay Presidency. Again, another family member. There's writer, 
the hand holding a quill, the presidency in Bombay, you'll notice this same icon on each of the three presidencies. All right. So there's the presidency of Bombay. Presidency of Bombay. We're going to place one of our family members as a writer here. Writers are kind of like, I guess, clerks, if you like. They're doing the business of the presidency, right? They're like administ it's an administrative role. But remember, one of the aims of the game is that we want to have office holders, such as presidents, retiring to earn victory points. That's how we get our victory points. When the president retires and this position becomes vacant, the vacancy is filled by writers. Okay, So it's good to have writers here because they can get promoted to the role of president and then they can retire. Right? So if you've got a stream of writers and retiring presidents, you can be earning lots of victory points. Make sense? Now, as it goes, these writers will also be the people who are off filling orders. When we do, when the president trades in a region, these writers will be filling orders and earning money for the company and for their own personal family. Right, that's that card fulfilled. So what's next? Uh, we are the president of Bengal. So we do indeed start the game holding this presidency of Bengal. Lovely. Done. We're also the president of Bombay. Great. And this last icon here is the share icon. We have a share in the company. Again, use one of your family members and we're going to place them here in the court of directors. You see the matching icon, this share icon. This is the East India Company logo. A family member in this court of directors is a share. Right, so we've got one share in the company. That's not many as it goes. The crown's going to have a lot more than that. At the end of the game, if the company succeeds, and in the 1710 scenario, the end of the game is when we get through five turns of the game. So each scenario will start. This is the round order tracker. So we started, it says 1710 here on round one. And there's a line here that says 1710. When we get to the end of round five, or turn five, that's the end of the game. If the company's still standing, then we also get a victory point for every share in the court of directors. There's another way for the game to, to end, and that is if the company fails. If the company fails if the company's standing, which we placed here at the, this midpoint. If the company's standing falls down to this F, the company fails and the game ends early, right, before the, the end of round five or turn five. This time there's a minus one in here, we get minus one victory point for every share in the company. So if you think the company's failing, you might want to be pulling shares out of the company. If you think the company is succeeding, you might want to be putting shares in because that's another way to get victory points. Um, company standing basically is a reflection of how well the company's doing. If the company's making lots of money, the company standing goes up. If the company's making less money, then the company standing goes down. Also, if we start controlling more regions of India, right? Remember, we're invading, we're getting governorships, we're controlling these different regions, building our presidencies. Our, our presidencies can expand. So at the moment, Bombay is just this one region of Bombay where the home port is. But if we want to expand into India, maybe take over the Punjab or Delhi, Maratha with the presidency of Bombay, the commander of Bombay expands invades these adjacent regions that's all great for the company but if any of those regions fall then the company standing goes down as well so there's a risk associated with that we'll come on, on to that as well but there you go that's company standing that's victory points that's court of directors and how shares can also earn, earn you victory points or lose you victory points okay that's everything i've done everything that uh, my four setup cards give me now, for each office holder that we have, there's a card, and it's these are here. These are the vacant offices. So they represent these different office holders all along the bottom, these different spaces. So I am the president of Bombay. So I find the card for president of Bombay, and I'll put that in my player area. And I'm also the president of Bengal. Now, I know, therefore, that the crown is going to be everything else. All right. So that's my two office holders. 
that's okay, I'm happy with that. So then if you look at the crown, we'll count up her, her money. She's got one, two, three, six, nine, ten, eleven, twelve pounds. So they play just like a regular player, they've got their own little treasury. So that's twelve pounds. They have got the Office of Military Affairs and a ship in the East Indian Ocean. So we take a ship from the shipyard, it happens to be the York. Grab the York, place it in the East, so it's a fitted ship in the East. The Manager of Shipping, they've got a share, done. The Commander of the Army of Bengal. These commanders are not office holders in the same way, so there's no cards for these. All right, so these commanders, they won't retire as pensioners. It's only these ones sitting here on the ribbons. All right. Commander of the Ar Army of Bengal, a writer in Bengal. Commander of the Army of Madras, a writer in Madras. They're also Prime Minister. Now, the Prime Minister gets the Prime Minister dial. This is an important role. They get to choose the new laws. They'll put the new laws up for vote. And it's got a little spinny arm to see which policy. It says little 1710 here. So you start the arm here. Because they're the uh, that's the starting position. Give that to the crown because they're the prime minister. All right, look out for that. And a random blackmail card, it says. Okay, we'll come to these in a little bit. But these are called uh, prestige cards. Give that a shuffle. Some have got red backs, some have got black backs. The black backed ones are blackmail cards. We'll take one at random, keep it face down. We can't see what it is. We'll give that to the crown because it was on this card. All right. Now those cards might have some special abilities on them. The crown's not going to use those special abilities. If we get those cards, we can use those special abilities. They're kind of little getches that you can use in the multiplayer game and in the solo game too. And they could award you victory points or power, which we'll come to in a little bit. All right, so they're the president of Madras. Um, uh, and, uh, and they get an extra share, another share. They're also the director of trade. And they get a ship in the South India Ocean. You should end up with one ship in each ocean, fitted. They happen to choose the Eliza. The Eliza in the South Seas. That's that one done. Crown is chairman. This is an important position. And an extra share. Oh, actually, we should have another share. We should have had another share in here too. Okay, good job. All right, yeah, there should be five shares in here. So I had two. I missed one. So yeah, President Bengal, President Bombay, and a share each. Right, that's everything. So that's the setup done. Right, these can go back in the box now. We don't need them. And we're ready to start playing the game. Oh, there's one final thing we need to do. Flip the first AA card and set the crown's starting climate. These are how these AI cards work. We're just looking at this little box in the middle here. It says the number of fitted ships out in India. There's one, two, three. Number of fitted ships, 0 to 5, they're going to start with their climate set to Lion. Okay, that's all we needed to do with that. And we'll place this bead here on Lion and we're ready to go. So these go to the crown. So we'll lay those out for the crown. Now a couple of times I've mentioned power. I'll mention it again now before we get going. Because it's important. At the end of the game, there's a power award. Throughout the game, you're going to be award, uh, awarded power for different things. When you collect these prestige cards, some of them may have power awards on them. When your commanders defeat regions, you'll get a trophy which awards one power. When a prime minister passes a law, they get a power. Right, so there's different ways to pick up power throughout the game. At the end of the game, depending on which turn it is, there's a power award. Total power from the power tree, from Prime Minister. Prime Minister gets a bonus of two power. It's here on his dial. See the power icon? Two power for being Prime Minister at the end of the game. 
past laws, blackmail cards, and trophies. Sum those all up. Whoever has the most is awarded, depending on which turn it is, uh, a number of victory points. So 1710, if we end at turn five, it'll be five victory points. Whoever has the most power, two points for second place. Power tree is this thing here. So on this dial, when you see power, this basically means shift the power, shift the power, okay? So for this, shares go up, shipping goes up, workshops go up, right? This basically means, so if workshops go up, you switch it like this with the one above, or manufacturing this is. Okay, so this tree will get shuffled about during the course of the game. And then at the end of the game, you'll be counting how many of these enterprises you have. So if shipyards are at the top here, you'll get two power for every shipyard enterprise in your player area. Okay, if company shares are at the top, they'll get you'll get an extra two points per share when fail or succeed. All right, so this can shift around and it's through the changes of policies when we're voting for laws, this power tree gets shifted around. So keep an eye on it. This is very dynamic. It can certainly swing power in favor of one player or another. So in this case, it will be two power for shares, one power for shipyards, nothing for workshops and luxuries. So you see, right, so social goes at the top, company share, manufacturing here, shipping here. So the setup tells you where everything begins. Okay, so sum those all up. Whoever has the most gets this bonus to their victory points. And that can give you the victory. <laughs> There's a lot to take in, but... That's the summary of it. Okay, so it's push your family members through into the company. They're gonna hopefully retire. This is during the London season, the start of every term, apart from term one. Uh, potential retirements come, spend money to earn victory points. Throughout the course of the game, you're fighting for money, for positions. Yeah, money, because these will cost upkeep. Uh, positions in the company for earning power in the company to get you that bonus victory points at the end. Okay, we're almost finished. We've just got to set up this London, I'll have to give it one more shuffle. The London display, uh, the London season display needs to be refreshed. We'll give it a split. Because okay. these are prestige cards. Whoever, during the London season, at the start of each turn, manages to retire some of their pensioners off to these mansions gets to pick from the London season display and these give you little bonuses. So these prestige cards like tax collectors counts as a workshop for example and has some special abilities. The Rotten Borough counts as a luxury enterprise and gives you three votes during Parliament when we're voting on laws. Now these ones with the black back, these ones have a red back, these are enterprises and spouses. We'll talk about that when we get there. But these black ones, these are the blackmail cards. They stay face down. We don't know what's on them because these are the getcha cards that remain secret apart from the players who get to peek at them. I think we're pretty much done. Shuffle the law cards and place them near the board. Right, so there's our laws. Ready to go. There's one final little thing. If the company does fail and therefore you're losing victory points for shares instead of gaining them, remember if we hit that F, there's another deck of cards, and we'll give this a little shuffle too. It's called the Company Failures. These things can really change things up because they will award victory points or take victory points away from the player that perhaps the public or the shareholders or whomever deems is responsible. What was responsible for the company failing will be written on the back of this card, and that will award some extra victory points or take some victory points away from particular players maybe it's people who ran shipping so whoever has the most shipyards or the people with the most shares or the least shares all right so different things can swing the victory point final tally on the turn of this card and this is really <laughs> drama inducing um, it can make it swingy and it can mean that you know you might think you've created this great strategy and it's suddenly blown by company failure but the game is all it's one of these games where it's never 
totally clear what you need to do to win the game, right? It's about pulling levers and seeing how it plays. And it's about the unravelling story of, of the company and how the company evolves through your scenario. Winning and losing tends to take second place if you're playing this game. It's all about the experience of playing the game. And those company failure cards really deliver that, that punchline that kind of gives everyone a dramatic moment at the end of a company failure. So if you don't like, you know, if you're, if you're building a tight strategy that can't afford to be hit by this swing, don't let the company fail. Because the only way you can be sure of what's going to happen at the end is for the company to succeed. So there are strong incentives built into the game for company success. And that's, I guess, a footnote to the end of this episode before we move into the start of turn one. Um, in the solo game, there is, and this is, although I'm saying that all the rules are the same, there's, there's a couple of little exceptions, and this is one exception. Um, at the end of the game, if the company failed, you do take a penalty, depending on how, how far you got the company through. So if the company fails on turn one, you get a minus five victory point penalty to your score. So an little extra thing thrown in to the solo game just to offer that extra incentive of for especially through the early turns you really need to try and help the company push on right so pushing for company failure in turn one is probably going to hit you hard and make you lose um, you can do it if you think you've got a winning strategy but try and work the, the game is going to incentivize you to work with the crown to get the company through those early turns right Let's get going then. So, turn one. So, we start here. This pawn's going to be used to track which phase of the game we're on. So, start of the game. We always skip London and season. We're going to start with the family phase and we start with the chairman, which is the crown, to go first. <laughs> 